Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections, and we're going to talk about Gorbachev. Uh, where does he fit in global history? He died a couple of weeks ago. We need to have a, a retrospective on uh, what he did, where he fit, and the influence he left, the legacy he left, if you will, on Russia and on Russian relations with the U.S. and other countries. For this discussion, uh, we have Carl Ackerman, who joins us from Honolulu, uh, and uh, Rob Matthews, who joins us from Chevy Chase. Uh, the two were on a trip together in 1991, where 25 students uh, rambled around Russia uh, with Carl and learned a lot about the Russian people, Russian history. And it just so happens they were there at the time of Glasnost, which um, left an impression on everyone involved. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you, Jay. You continue to be the, the king of Menchud. And, <laughs> and Rob, of course, it's you know it's one of the greatest pleasures in a long time to be able to see you in person and hear you speak. <laughs> so the, I, the feeling is tell mutual. Me, tell me where uh, Gorbachev fits on this. I mean, how did he rise to power? What sort of power did he have, and what was happening under his feet, so that we could have Glasnost, you know, under him, around him, changing Russia, you know, for a long time, hopefully forever. Um, uh, you know, and I think we need to know what Glasnost actually was and what the change in Russia was. Rob, can you talk about, uh, you know, your perceptions of Mikhail Gorbachev and, and what you found, what you learned, what you know now about uh, his, his uh, imprimatur on Russian history? Uh, well, to be, to be totally honest, a lot of my perspective comes from uh, my own personal experience uh, just as a teenager growing up in the United States and spending um, a surprisingly fortuitous uh, summer in, in Russia um, and experiencing the, the culture and the, the people that were there. And uh, in retrospect, it's certainly the case that the society that we experienced in those weeks um, didn't seem remarkable at all to us at the time. But in retrospect, um, that I think is very much the, the outcome from Gorbachev's uh, policies of Glasnost and Perestroika. Um, and this was what, six or seven years into his, uh, his, his transition. So um, what, we, what I remember experiencing in the, um, in the city of Sochi was a very, a pretty open and uh, welcoming city and um, a lot of freedom of movement and um, a lot of tourism. Um, and I, I feel like certainly in retrospect, that is a credit to uh, his policies in the years leading up to that point. Well, uh, you know, Carl, can I turn to you now, or is yes. it soup? Is it soup? Okay. No, no, it's 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 good. So, you know, um, this was a remarkable time um, for um, Robert and I to be in the Soviet Union along with twenty four of his colleagues, and uh, you know, it was during the coup. So we actually saw the coup front head, and ironically, we were in Sochi and very safe. And because you know, Soviet bureaucracy is what it is, they flew us right into the middle of the coup in Moscow the day it started. And I'll always remember my Soviet contact saying to me, Karl Leopoldovich, small problem, coup d'etat, as we landed in Moscow. And so, you know, my job was to make sure that these 20, uh, uh, 25 students were well kept, well kept. But the answer to your question is, you know, what people fail to, re I think they failed to realize this at the time is, Mikhail Gorbachev was trying to improve the Soviet Union. Uh, Glasnost didn't mean democracy, it meant openness. And he was trying to improve the economic system and perestroika was just that, a restructuring of the economic system. So he was a party secretary bent on reform. He didn't, he was a, a true Marxist-Leninist. And, you know, in later years when he went to the West and, and actually had his foundation, he became much more, much more of a liberal Democrat, um, small d. And um, so that's what we have to remember, but still it was very, brave of him. I mean, he did not want to go into Eastern Europe and put down um, rebellions. And so, you know, the Berlin Wall, well, wall fell in 1989. Um, so 
Uh, Gorbachev, uh, you know, even among Russian scholars, uh, there were people all across the country, especially people on the left, um, who were saying, yes, this is going to be a great Soviet Union. You know, it's going to, uh, it, the Soviet Union is going to be able to reform itself. And there was one professor at Berkeley named Martin Melia. And Martin Melia wrote a, a piece in the New York Times called Z, um, you know, to kind of uh, refer to the um, X uh, document that appeared um, uh, in, by George Kennan during the Cold War, which is, you know, absolute deterrence. Uh, Kennan, um, you know, George Kennan advocated for, you know, fighting against the Soviets in every way possible. But Martin Melia wrote this, uh, this piece called Z, and it was in the New York Times. And what he said is you can't reform a totalitarian system. If you open it up, it's going to fall like a house of cards. And indeed, Martin Melia was right. And Martin Melia was always sort of center right. And he got this one right. And I'm not trying to advocate for the right or the left here. I'm just, you know, trying to tell you what happened. And um, I'm going to embarrass my, my student now because when we got on the bus and we were... Um, we were going to our hotel, and then we took a tour during the three days of the coup with the kids eating, you know, McDonald's hamburgers because Gorbachev had let a lot, a lot of different things in. But when we got on the bus originally, you know, there were tanks surrounding us, and it was a very difficult situation. And of course, I stood up, and my 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 colleague Gail, who was my co chaperone, we told the students not to do anything crazy. So anyway, to end the story, um, Robert, who had just a you know, just a wonderful sense of humor. And um, while I can't say he was a favorite, I had to treat all the students carefully. I really admired his humor. And he stood up as if he were in the Wizard of Oz and he was Dorothy. And he clicked his heel three times standing up and said, I wish I were home. I wish I were home. I wish I were home, which brought down the house on the bus. Because you, you can imagine these tanks were passing us. We were on the ring road. You know, we didn't know whether we'd be, you know, um, stopped and put in prison or fired upon, you know, because we had an American flag on our bus. So anyway, that's, uh, Rob, you, you, you saved the day in a sense because you made people much more relaxed. Mm, Rob, you want to do rebuttal on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, as we were talking, it, it uh, and specifically, you know, thinking about the, the, the cultural differences of the the glasnost period versus the, the more totalitarian state i it made me realize that um the morning that we were supposed to fly back to and supposed to and did fly into moscow um you know the night before everything was quote unquote normal um uh and then i woke up that morning with my bags packed and ready to get on the bus get on the plane and fly to moscow and uh, <clears throat> the host brother that was uh, part of the small family that I was living with, he came into my bedroom, which was really just um, like a three season porch. I was sleeping on a couch for the few weeks that I was living with them. He came in and he said, um, Gorbachev is very sick. Uh, the uh, news has gone off the air and um, he has, uh, he has retired or resigned. He said something like that. And sure enough, everything that we had had experienced, you know, on that morning, it all changed. And suddenly, you know, I did witness what it would be like in an environment where there was no television, there was no news. It all switched to classical music. And, um, and we, I remember standing on the sidewalk waiting to get on the bus to go to the airport and no one had any idea what was going on. Um, none of the kids, we didn't get a whole lot of information from our guides because they didn't have a whole lot of information to give us. And so we just piled onto the plane and landed in Moscow. And suddenly, as Carl mentioned, we were driving around Moscow with tanks and armored personnel carriers all along the highways and at, on all the cor street corners. And, and the next day we went on a tour of the... Uh, the museum at the Kremlin. Not to be deterred. <laughs> so what is it with the coup? What was, what, what, what happened in the coup? Who was um, doing what? And what was the result of it? Well, the, you, the, the, basically what there was, you know, a right wing in the, in the Politburo, 
And I'm trying to remember whether it was Gorasimov or, or not the general that was in charge. Um, but they planned a coup against Gorbachev. They arrested him, you know, in his in, in the Sochi area, in the Crimea, actually. It wasn't in Sochi, it was in Crimea. We were in Sochi. And, um, and there was an attempt to move Russia in a much more right-wing direction and replace him in the Politburo. And, um, you know, what was supposed to happen is, uh, according to the coup planners, is they were going to take over everything, you know, fire on the crowds and... Um, you know, it was a case like the Russian Revolution of February 1917. The, the Russian troops just did not see this happening and they were not going to fire on the crowds. And um, they ended up joining, you know, the demonstrators. And, you know, eventually Gorbachev uh, came back to power. And, um, you know, eventually, like within several months, he will, um, you know, leave power and uh, Boris Yeltsin will take over. But it was it was a failed coup d'etat because the. Uh, the right wingers did not have enough enough support, and um, one of the ironies of life is that this entire trip for us was sort of a, a crazy trip because, it, uh, as Robert will tell you, we were supposed to be in Almaty in Kazakhstan. That was the original destination, and suddenly we went to Sochi because, you know, the Soviet inter system there was a glitch, and so we ended up miles away. We weren't in Kazakhstan; we were in Russia, and then while we were in Sochi, there was a um, tornado um there was an outbreak of cholera and, and there was a, and then there was a coup so um you know it was it was quite a trip and you know the you know the 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 kids were staying as um robert said in uh no longer kids i may add young adults um uh were staying in host families and so they got a really good look of what soviet life was like even under the gorbachev period and you know some of the young women were staying with families that um, were very conservative about women going out and, um, you know, uh, they might have belonged to, um, you know, I'm an Islamic sect and, um, you know, were concerned about women going out at all. And so there were lots of different um, cultural things that the, uh, that our students had to realize. And of course, Russian students, I mean, Russian kids, you know, from a pretty young age are able to drink. And they learn not to drink, you know, in great quantities. But, you know, the kids that were in the homestays, you know, had access to alcohol, too. And so that was another thing, because, you know, American students are taught not to drink alcohol at all. And so when exposed to this, most of the kids, you know, kept their wits about them. But there were a couple of kids that I had to go in the middle of the night and, you know, de detoxify them because they had been offered too much liquor by their host families. You mean vodka. He means vodka. Yeah, it was it was well, it was Georgian wine, and it was it was vodka, and it was uh, you know, the, and the, and the, and the joke about vodka is the word for um, water in Russian is voda, and you know what vodka is, of course, and you know Russians drink vodka like Americans drink voda. That's the that's the kind of funny <laughs> phrase. So Rob, let's uh, let's unpack some of that. Um, you, you mentioned uh, before the show that uh, the Russians uh, liked Americans. Um, that they were friendly to you and so forth, and that's really important. Um, and and there had been, you know, uh, um, uh, under Gorbachev, there had been a kind of enlightenment, uh, a, a move to be more liberal, more accepting uh, from from the Cold War. Because remember, you know, the U.S. and Russia had been in the Cold War, and now it was somehow softening with with Gorbachev. Um, just to say, as Carl said, that it was a failed coup, not a successful one. And he came back, although not for all that long. But my, you know, my question is, um, you know, how, how did the Russian people that you interacted with feel about Gorbachev? Was, was he a statement of the future for them? Um, or did they see him as a somehow retrograde? I honestly don't remember having any direct conversations with the um, with the, the Russian students about uh, Gorbachev or any specific politicians on either side of the Cold War. I remember speaking to them and having conversations with them about more general kinds of conversations about, I, th I remember having a conversation with somebody, um, I think we were at a tea plantation, Carl, and um, I remember we just sat down and we started talking about, you know, they had no real idea what it was like to live in America, not surprisingly. 
Um, but for me as a 17 year old kid with very little world experience, I was sort of surprised by that. I just kind of assumed that everybody knew what it was like to live in America. And so they asked questions like, would Americans be willing to help us move to a market economy? And I thought, of course, how could you question that? Of course, there are Americans that would want to help you move to it. And so it felt very um, optimistic, this whole conversation. And, um, you know, in the, the 10 years or so that followed that, the, um, the story didn't quite play out that way. But um, I, that was a, a moment in time that I, I will distinctly remember. And this is, of course, a couple of weeks before the coup actually took place. So everything seemed very, very normal to everybody around. No one had any indication that this was about to, that everything was about to end. Were they unwilling or perhaps unable to talk to you about Russian politics? I don't really know the answer to that. I don't, I, we certainly had some conversations about bureaucracy and the kind of um, the Soviet system in very general terms, just kind of like the, the jokes on the street kind of thing. Um, I don't remember ever having any specific conversations about uh, what the political system was like uh, for the kids. Because, you know, for the most part, they were, I mean, my host brother, who I lived with, was only 15. Um, so they were all about the same ages as we were. They weren't really out in the world themselves yet, either. You stay in touch with him? Uh, I stayed in touch with him for a little while, but, um, you know, 30 years is a long time. I've lost touch with him since then. Uh I'll go with that. You learned that here on Think Tech. 30 years is really a long time. And, and Carl Ackerman can help us understand that. <laughs> so, so Rob, uh, you know, uh, you, you apparently jumped up and down uh, and said, uh, I want to go home. Why? Why did you do that? Um, probably just to make people laugh. I mean, I actually, I, I was really enjoying being in the thick of it. Um, I was not eager to go home. Um, so I, uh, I, I was not, I mean, I was one of the more careful, um, students in the group, um, when it came to, um, while we were, I remember driving around, some of the students were kind of waving at the soldiers and, and, um, I thought that was probably pushing the envelope a little bit, but, um, um, yeah, I, it didn't seem all that dangerous to you. I didn't. I didn't think that we were in any real danger, mm -hmm. but I also didn't want to poke the bear. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the story Carl told about you. But what what's the story you were going to tell us about Carl? <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> um, well, you know, we 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 drove around. You know, the first day we landed, we drove around. Um, we tried to, uh, I mean, not we, the uh, the guides and the drivers did try to get us to the parliament building, um, which was cordoned off um, by barricades. But um, the following day, we went to the Kremlin Museum and we toured Moscow and walked around the streets and bought things on the streets, just like we were regular tourists, because that's, I mean, we went to, like Carl said, we went to McDonald's. Um, and the story I remember is that um, on one of our little excursions, as you know, we kind of broke out into groups and let people wander around the streets a little bit. And um, me and a friend of mine were uh, walking along the, the sidewalk, and Carl told us to stop, and he walked further down the store, the uh, the path, and talked to a, a a uniformed individual in front of a door somewhere. And then Carl came back and, and brought us over. And he said, um, I just told this guard that you two are the children of diplomats. And so he is allowing us to go into this cemetery. And it was the Novodvetsky Cemetery. And um, we went and visited Khrushchev's grave. And uh, Carl told us, uh, given the moment in history that we're at, um, I felt it was important to go visit Khrushchev's grave to whatever degree we could. And so the guard was more than willing to 
I suspect, take some money and uh, believe the story that we were uh, diplomats. And I guess we looked Russian enough that uh, we, he let us through the door. And so that's our, that's my story of how I got in to see Khrushchev's grave on August 20th, 1991. Wow. Wow. And yeah, uh, Carl, but uh, you said that um, a third of the group were Japanese. No, um, they were, um, you know, uh, they were um, Howley kids mostly from all over, um, from all over the United States because it, it was an American field service trip. And, you know, as I recall, we may have had some training in um, upstate New York um, before we left, but in other words, it, you, they were kids from all over the place. Um, uh, and they were, they were kids from all over. And just to add to that story, no money exchanged hands, <laughs> um, but, 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 but. It's a better story, story with money exchanging hands, Carl. We're yeah, leaving right it now. ambiguous. Yeah, but, yeah, hey. yeah. No, but, but the story about me telling that they were, uh, you know, American, that the sons um, and uh, daughter of, uh, uh, sons, sons of American diplomats is true because in Russia, um, you know, even today, you know, if you want to get anywhere, you have to tell like sort of a white lie in order to get someplace. Because if you're just a regular part of the Noro, the general people, they're not going to budge. And so, uh, you know, I told this white lie in order to get these kids into to see uh, Nikita Khrushchev's grave, which is, of course, um, uh, was, was just so apropos given his attempts to reform Russia himself. Um, during the coup with with Mikhail Gorbachev, and you know, Jay, this is w what Rob said has particularly um, uh, a particular significance for what's happening today. Remember, he talked about his host brother coming after watching the television, and still, most Russians have one, to, you know, have a television, and they get most of their news from that, and they reflect that news um, the way. People do sometimes by only watching, you know, either CNN or Fox News. They don't try to get the, uh, you know, the alter uh, the alternative opinion. And they, you know, especially people in our country that, that you know, listen to sort of craziness, um, you know, on <clears throat> either far left or far right, um, you know, podcasts and stuff like that. And they take that verbatim. Um, in Russia, um, you know, I, I, the Russians, um, at least I give them some credit because that's the only thing available. That's why. Vladimir Putin is being able to do what what he um, what what he has done. But I have to say about Rob and his twenty four colleagues, they were really good. I mean, you know, it was it took his. I immediately called our embassy, and they couldn't get us out before the date that we had to plan, which was three days later. And by that time, the coup was over, and and Mikhail Gorbachev was restored and back in Moscow. But it was a it was a pretty for me as an adult it was it was pretty frightening and we were we were taking the subways and i always remember these young guys with bullhorns you know who were leading the movement you know the, the student movement of course they could have been shot like you know at tiananmen square and things like this because it was a marxist Leninist regime but you know people had seen the flowering of glasnost and perestroika and even though under gorbachev a lot of they had people had a lot of problems with getting goods and and services and of course Originally, he put a ban on vodka, which is, you know, you don't do that in Russia. Um, but uh, uh, so people were complaining about him, but they appreciated the kind of freedoms they had. And a lot of people weren't scared anymore. You know, I mean, things had to happen. Well, how, you know, how important was he in turning the country toward Glasnost? How important was he in, light, in enlightening Russia? Because that happened right around that time. Was this his intention? What was his philosophical um, you know, orientation here? Uh, what what made it possible for this to happen under him? Rob, I'm going to let you take a crack, and then I'll take a crack. <laughs> uh, certainly, my impression is that it's entirely due to him. Um, but there, were, I, my understanding is that there were there were some shoots of reform that were trying to poke up through the bureaucracy and the the system before he came, took over, but. Um, it was, it was his, his, uh, entire personality, his motivation, you know, everything about him was, uh, dedicated to that prospect of, of reforming Russia and within the system, as Carl pointed out, he didn't, he was not trying to institute a democratic system, um, at the time, but, he it was it was his um 
it was really his his show. Hmm. Okay, so he's really important in in understanding modern Russia because of you know the huge inflection point that Glasnost created uh, or reflected. And here we are, thirty years later, um, and we have Vladimir Putin there. Putin, who was, uh, as I recall, he was in East Germany, East Berlin, at the time the wall was taken down, trying to protect uh, KGB documents and the like. Uh, that you know the story about how he prevented the the mob in East Germany from tearing down the Russian embassy. Uh, there by speaking to them in German because he does speak German. The whole, the whole thing. He was instrumental, but very loyal and faithful to the preservation of, um, you know, of, of the USSR. Um, okay, so how? What's the connection between uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and Glasnost and Enlightenment or reform to the extent it happened in Russia? Um, and um, Vladimir Putin, we, we need to connect it somehow or not. Um, would you say that Vladimir Putin liked what Gorbachev had done for Russia or was he um, unhappy about it? Carl? You know, um, I would say that, you know, the response, and I, I agree with Rob about, you know, it was Gorbachev, um, you know, he's entirely responsible, but he was reacting you may recall that the United States had just launched this kind of missile system called Star Wars under Ronald Reagan. And um, he needed to reform his country in order to even compete in the Cold War. So that was his motivation. He wanted to make the Soviet Union stronger. Um, so that's why he launched Perestroika. Well, first Glasnost and then, per well, first Perestroika, then Glasnost. But the connection is that Boris Yeltsin, who took over after um, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was still a pretty reforming guy. I mean, he allowed democracy to flourish. He allowed lots of different um, thick journals to be published. You know, um, one was called Spark Oganyok. Um, and there was a lot of uh, democratic uh, uh, fever going on or fervor going on in, um, in Russia. Um, the problem was that, you know, Boris Yeltsin was older and he was drinking a lot of vodka and they wanted someone new and vibrant. And so he turned to this young guy who came out of a fairly liberal um, cohort in St. Petersburg, um, Leningrad initially, and then St. Petersburg. And then, uh, you know, people thought of him as sort of continuing the reforms, even though he had been KGB, because you could be, you could be part of the government and still be liberal. Um, but as it turned out, you know, um, they didn't know enough about Vladimir Putin. And of course, he has almost a psychosis, um, as Macron said the other day on CNN, about the Soviet Union falling. And so, and I, I think that, you know, um, Boris Yeltsin and uh, even Mikhail Gorbachev wouldn't like that, you know, the Soviet Union to sort of dis disintegrate. I don't think either of them would have been for that. But under the current conditions, I think both men would have reacted much differently. But um, and I, I think what they failed to realize, so to put it in sort of a historical perspective, Mikhail Gorbachev was a Westerner going back to the 19th century. And these guys always, these politicians and philosophers always looked to the West and saw the West as a beacon of light. And there was another group called the Slavophiles in the 19th century. And they thought of greater Russia and only great Russia can do this. And we have our own morality and stuff like that. And, Actually, Vladimir Putin fits right into that. And so did Boris Yeltsin know this when he appointed um, Vladimir Putin? Probably not. Um, he didn't think that Vladimir Putin would be the kind of guy that he is. So that's my sort of loose hmm. way. Don't you think that uh, uh, Boris Yeltsin, and for that matter, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, would approve of what Putin has done since and what Putin is doing now? Oh, well, I think that um, although at least in the, the, the things I've read of, uh, about Gorbachev in the, the last few weeks or so, it's, it, it's clear that he was uh, disappointed in the way that, the, that Putin had been directing Russia away from his reforms. Um, and I, I have to believe that because my impression of, of uh, 
Yeltsin is that he was an even stronger reformer in that way. I think that he was much more of a, a, a Democrat, a lowercase Democrat, than, than Gorbachev was. Um, and so I think that both of them, I mean, Gorbachev was, I don't know, maybe he wasn't explicitly, uh, I don't know how uh, verbal he was about it, but it seemed like he was pretty obviously disappointed in the direction that Putin had taken the, uh, the country. And uh, my suspicion is that Yeltsin would have been even more so. Looking back at your trip 30 years ago, um, actually a little more than that, and, um, and then integrating that with what we read in the newspaper uh, these days, especially over the past five months, um, would you go back to Russia now? Um, Even if Carl asked you asked that nicely? question, my family and I have had a, a <laughs> pending, a pending trip that we have uh, been hoping to take for the past two, three years, maybe even longer, that where we would take the Trans-Siberian Railway all the way across Russia with um, some of our Russian friends. Um, that has been postponed <laughs> mm -hmm. for various mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love to go back, uh, assuming that uh, it's safe to do so. Um, I would love to go back and, and see Sochi again, see Moscow again, see how things have changed and things have not changed. Yeah. They say that the Trans-Siberian Railroad is only tolerable if you, if you spend your time on the vodka. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd, I'd rush back to that I, or I'd rush back to that, never mind. Uh, so, Carl, um, let's try to, you know, make sense of this. Um, what, if any, influence do you think that Gorbachev had, now that he's dead, um, on the Russian people? I mean, it, for example, it, is, is it a sad moment that he died? Did they miss him? Was there a big funeral? Um, uh, I, I, as I recall, um, Putin did not attend the funeral. Uh, he he had something else on on his, on his schedule that day, but um, you know, query: What do the Russian people feel about uh, Mikhail Gorbachev now? Now that he died, it seems to me a mark in history. But maybe a lot of people don't feel that way. And and what uh, influence do you think he had on today's Russia, today's Putin? Well, I think that you know. Um, he was admired by many people who admire democracy in Russia. And remember, it was just a brief experiment. And, um, you know, it went from 1991 uh, through um, actually, you know, a part of the century, um, you know, at least five or 10 years. And then Putin is, is you know, I mean, it's still they have, a you know, a quote unquote democratic elections and they have some some notion of free press, but that's limited. So uh, I think that. Um, to answer your first question, it was a well-attended uh, funeral. Uh, Vladimir Putin came earlier and with flowers, um, but he didn't attend the official ceremony. Um, so I think that people have mixed reactions. Most Russians have mixed reactions about uh, about Mikhail Gorbachev. It was a time of economic problems, so they remember that if they're old enough. Um, the younger people probably have great enthusiasm for him because they're the ones that are developing their capitalist interests and. You know, they're used to the new philosophy and um, if they remember him at all. Um, but, you know, people liked that sort of liberal flowering, um, but they also had problems with his um, economic policies. So I think that 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 sort of puts it in, in perspective. And I think that, you know, his legacy is this, I think, is that there is a democratic movement in Russia. And I think that's his legacy. That's his long term legacy. And whether it turns out to be the kind of, um, you know, Republican democracy that we have in the United States, um, we'll have to see, um, because Russians tend to like, you know, because of the century of very strong rulers, they tend to like, you know, as they say, Silvani Chelovek, a strong leader. Um, and they, it was interesting that they really liked Kennedy um, during my early years in the in the '60s when I was there, and they they thought of Kennedy as a very strong leader, and of course he was the main. Um, enemy of Nikita Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So um, I thought that was interesting, but it shows where they gravitate. And I think a lot of people in the world today, if you look at Italy, um, are gravitating towards 
uh, you know, some right right wing dictators. Of course, of course, the German example is just the opposite. So, in any case, I think that the legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev is the democratic spirit among the people, the Russian people, and um, you can see what's happening now. And of course, the other legacy is that you know he did not invade. He didn't invade Germany. Um, he didn't follow the Brezhnev doctrine. Um, you know that that Brezhnev followed in 1968 under you know when Czechoslovakia wanted to go a little bit more liberal. So, you know the Russians for the for the you know for the most part are do not want war. And of course they learned in Chechnya that they're going to have you know their Russian children come back in body bags. So I think the two legacies of Mikhail Gorbachev are peace and um, also um, the democratic spirit. Okay, I was going to ask you, um, you know, what what Vladimir Putin would say about the influence that Gorbachev had on him, and I think that that that's, that speaks through the fact that he really did not uh, make a full a full attendance at Gorbachev's funeral. There's a statement there. What 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 do you think? What do you think he would say? What do you think Putin would say? about the influence on him of Gorbachev? I think that, um, as Carl pointed out, I think that he, uh, that uh, the psychosis was, is that the word that you referred to? Um, I think that that's fairly true. I think that, that through that lens, you, I mean, whether it's just the psychosis or if it's just simply um, a fixation, uh, through that lens, you can sort of explain away a lot of what Putin has done over the last 10 to 15 years, um, trying to reclaim the, the glory of uh, both the Soviet Union and the emperor, the um, imperialistic uh, Russia before that. Yeah, so he would not be too happy with Gorbachev. He was trying to reverse what Gorbachev had done. I do okay, think that uh, that's a, a lot of what motivates his, certainly his foreign policy, uh, is directed at restoring that uh, that position in the world that Russia apparently, at least in his mind, once had. So, Rob, I want to ask you one more question. You were seventeen. You were impressionable. Um, you were, uh, you know, how do you define a seventeen-year-old student? And um, you, you got, you know, you had a lot of surprises. The trip was filled with surprises of one kind or another, thrills and chills all around Russia. You know, you, you must have talked about it for months, uh, maybe longer than that. And, and of course, if you have a trip like that, even without the surprises, um, it, it helps you appreciate a place. It helps define that place in your mind and memory. And of course, I would expect that you have followed the events in Russia more than most people, more than people who've never been there, for example. And, and here we are 30 years later, and you're a little reluctant to take the uh, Trans-Siberian Railway or <laughs> otherwise uh, spend time in Russia again. But how do you feel about the country today? How do you feel mm, about what is happening in, uh, in the protests in Moscow, what is happening in the Russian, the young Russian people, some of them who might be your age right now today, who are trying to get out of there any way they can, including a lot of software developers like <laughs> you, I might add. Uh, how do you feel about Russia in the, in the uh, what do you want to call it, uh, uh, Carl referred to this, in the, in the, the transformational, transitional times between uh, when you were there and now? Uh, well, certainly the, the current moment is uh, fairly disheartening. Uh, leading up to, I would say, you know, leading up to probably the, uh, shortly after the Sochi Olympics, um, it seemed like there was op still optimism. And, um, and that spirit that I remember from those days uh, is still present. And it, it, there are certainly uh, pockets of that. And I certainly know people who, um, have more direct experience um, who still share some of that optimism. But uh, overall, you know, when I open up the, the, the virtual newspaper every day these days, it's like a real flashback to those, um, those final days uh, wandering around Moscow. 
Mm. Talk about flashbacks, Carl. Uh, 30 years later, uh, what do you think of Rob? You know, uh, looking at him today versus uh, as a 17 year old on the trip with you. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing uh, about Rob, and this is also true of my uh, Iolani and Punahou students, is their faces don't change all that much. They just, <laughs> people get taller and um, the kids were from, you know, 15 to 17, and they were uh, mostly, you know, Rob's age and stuff like that. And I, Jay, what, a, what the thing that I wanted to convey is that, you know, when we landed back in New York, um, the, you know, the parents were there. And of course, the parents had no idea what was going on. We barely could get information out. I luckily I had a friend in the State Department and he tried to do wonders. And, you know, he lives in Honolulu, by the way, in Hawaii, Kai Jay, just for that information. Um, but it was, the students were remarkably resilient. But okay, let me, I, let me let me also ask you finally one last question. Um, would you go back with a bunch of kids today to Russia, Carl? My answer is not today, but sometime in the future. And maybe I'll join Rob in his Trans-Siberian Railroad uh, venture with my family because my girls uh, want to go. And they say, Dad, we have to go before we get too old because you can I hope you speak go a smattering and, of Russian. I hope, you, I hope you go and I hope you come back too. And I hope you join us for another retrospective on life in Russia as a, a student group, uh, you know, observing what is happening around you. It's really fascinating to consider all the changes. On the other hand, when you, when you consider those changes and you um, compare them to the changes in this country, uh, we are no less full of surprises. Well, thank you very much, Carl. Carl Ackerman, uh, Rob Matthews, really appreciate you coming around and talking about the the good old days, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.